Good afternoon, my name is Dave Norton from Discovering New England History, and we're going to begin episode two of the uh, complete story of the Hindenburg, and the year is 1936, and we're also going to go into 1937. Okay, first slide here, 1936. Now, a lot of people don't really realize this, but the Hindenburg had made 10 flights from Germany to America uh, before it actually crashed, and also an additional seven flights from Germany to Rio de Janeiro. And uh, the, uh, what they used to lift it up, of course, was hydrogen. They could not get the helium. Now, the next slide here, here we are in uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey. This picture was taken, 1936. And it shows they were going in and out of the hangar, and they were making all these trips, 10 trips from uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey to Frankfurt, Germany, a year before it crashed. And uh, I detail all these, the Atlantic Ocean crossings. They made 10 round trips to America in 1936, Frankfurt, Germany to Lakehurst, New Jersey. And over there on the left, details, of course the first one was in May of 1936, but it detail, details all the trips they made. And on the uh, far right is uh, like a poster they would have uh, well, across America, basically, and across Germany, saying it's two days to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Now, Germany, 1936, the Germany, they were using this as a uh, propaganda tool. They would just fly it around Germany and be dropping different pamphlets uh, promoting the, uh, the Nazi government. And there's a picture of it. Uh, and I tried to find out what building it was flying over, and I think I got it pretty good there on the right. That's called the Academy of Arts in 1936. That's the first uh, propaganda flight. Then there's the famous Brandenburg Gate, Berlin, Germany, 1936. It's the original photo on the left. And you can see all the people in the... Uh, standing by to watch it, and you can see the uh, Brandenburg Gate today. Now, this is very important. In 1936, Berlin, Germany hosted the uh, World Olympic Games. And uh, they had this as a great opportunity to show off their uh, Hindenburg. And you can see on the right there, you can see the um, uh, Olympic flags. And on the left, you can see the uh, Hindenburg going over uh, the stadium in Berlin. And on the left of your picture there, that's a postcard, and it shows a, uh, the Hindenburg with the uh, Olympic flag, and it shows the, uh, the stadium that was distributed all around the world. And on the right is, a, once again, an original picture of uh, the Hindenburg flying over uh, the stadium in 1936 as the Olympic Games were proceeding. And this is a great shot. <laughs> it shows Berlin, it shows the whole Olympic Stadium. And you can see the Hindenburg just uh, making circles around it. Now, they did a lot of promotion, Hindenburg promotion in 1936. On the uh, left and the top, you can see Lakehurst, New Jersey. Uh, they were handing out these uh, Hindenburg uh, pennants as souvenirs. Right below that, you can see a lot of the postage stamps from Germany. They all showed the Hindenburg. And, uh, I, you know, I have a couple items to show you here. Uh, this one here is actually a World War I pocket knife, okay, uh, which I picked up, showed Hindenburg in the uh, 
Germans were very interested in uh, distributing all these. And on the back, you can see it's a uh, uh, World War I issue when he was actually uh, head of the German army. That's an original. And then in late 1900, I think 1997, they came out with a, um, an actual souvenir type of thing, which I have here. It actually is a, uh, it's a smaller pocket knife, but you can see it's uh, got the Hindenburg on it. And this one here was made in, uh, in Germany and uh, very, very detailed celebrating that. And then I'll go back to that uh, yeah, original photo there. I, I had two coins here, which I showed. They were both uh, commemorating Hindenburg. And they were show the year that uh, <clears throat> he was no longer in power, 1934, in both of those. But you can see the difference on the back. These other coins were made in 1936. You could see all it had was a was kind of a German eagle, the one on the top. The one on the bottom, uh, Adolf Hitler change. You can see now it's got the German eagle with the swastika sticker on it. And I have those, those, two, uh, those two right here in my collection. They were doing everything they could to promote the Hindenburg. Now these, uh, an interesting here, these I had uh, on the internet. On the Hindenburg, there was actually a whole post office on there. And the fellow was a uh, postmaster. <laughs> and all the uh, passengers on there, that was a thing to do. They would purchase the uh, post, postcards, if you will, like those, these two here, and they would actually cancel them right here on the Hindenburg. And of course, it was great for um, uh, the post office. I mean, you could get, <laughs> get something sent from Germany and, and arrive uh, two days later in the United States, and that was incredible. Um, and that's typically what they had. You take the one on the uh, left, you can see the arrow, and it said uh, LZ-129, which is the number of the Hindenburg, and it says Hindenburg on it. And then the one that's stamped on the right, also with the Hindenburg stamp on it, canceled on that. And uh, collectors really like these items. I'll show you the next one here. These two I had. I, I picked these up. <laughs> and uh, these are the originals for my collection. You can see stamped. These actually were on the Hindenburg. And this is the second one right here. Okay. That's quite a part of, uh, quite a part of history. Now, we're going to go over something that's really incredible. It's called the Millionaire's Flight, October 9th, uh, 1936. It was after the Berlin Olympics. And what Germany wanted to do was get all the uh, powerful people in the United States on board to help finance having these um, hydrogen-filled Zeppelins go across the United States and perhaps go from California to Hawaii. And so what they did is they had uh, 72 of the top executives in the United States, and they put them all on the Hindenburg and did a 10 and a half an hour, 10, <laughs> 10 and a half hour trip all around New England. And that's why this is a New England story. This was in 1936 now. And I put some of the top executives on there. There were 72 of these. Edward McDonald was the director of Pan American Airlines, Hans Luther, German ambassador to the United States, Jack Fry, president of TWA, Paul Litchfield, president of Goodyear Rubber, Eddie Rickenbacker, Eastern Airlines, and Nelson Rockefeller, president of Chase National Bank. There were 72 of these executives. And for a marketing tool, this is the most incredible marketing scheme I've ever seen. <laughs> they waited until October, 
okay, when fall was in New England. And you can see on the map there, they started in Lakehurst, went up to Newark, all the way up to Danbury, Connecticut, Hartford, Springfield, Worcester, Boston, back down to Providence, down to New Haven, and all the way back down, well, actually you circled uh, Philadelphia and then to Lakehurst. Very impressive trip. So I'm going to re redo this here. Pretend you're on the, uh, on the Hindenburg. And here we are. Here we are. This is a colorized version taken in uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey. All right. And it's a 10 hour cruise, and they're all aboard. Now they went up the Hudson River, and this is an actual picture in the fall of the Hudson River. It's wonderful to have drones now. <laughs> You can actually take the actual elevation, so it's between 300 feet and 660 feet. And this is what the passengers would have viewed when they uh, started off on this uh, test flight. Then it went across to Danbury, Connecticut. Then it went to Hartford, Connecticut in the fall. It's about the uh, elevation that uh, they took all these 72 executives on. This was way bef a year before the uh, Hindenburg, of course, crashed. Then they went up to Springfield and then to Worcester, Massachusetts. This is an incredible marketing scheme. <laughs> It went to Boston, Massachusetts, and they circled around Boston several times. Providence, Rhode Island. And of course, all the folks in the, uh, all these different states and uh, cities were uh, watching in the sky to see when it was gonna come over. New Haven, Connecticut. And back to Lakehurst Naval Air Station. This is a great picture I found. The arrow points to the hangar to see how big the hangar was. And that's the naval base at Lakehurst. That's where all the, uh, boy, the Hindenburg was. But all those, all those trips for uh, the whole year of 1936. And here's a New England connection. And you say, how can, this, how can this be? Well, these group of executives formed the American Zeppelin Transport Company. Okay, so some were from Germany and this fella here, Jerome Hunsaker is the officer and he's standing up. I got the arrow in the, in the picture on the left. And I looked him up and he was a graduate of U.S. Naval Academy of Annapolis, professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he was a, uh, in charge of the mechanical and aeronautical engineering department, and he was an, actually an inventor in 1913 of the first ever wind tunnel in the United, that they put together in the United States for testing, and now he's an officer of the American Zeppelin Transport Company. Um, I checked the manifest and he was not on this particular flight in October. And there's one of the brochures advertising two and a half days, two days to Europe, and there's a picture of the schematic of, that was all over the United States and all over Germany. Now, we're gonna go on this, uh, another trip on the Hindenburg, this time it's leaving from Frankfurt, Germany. And this is going to be the uh, famous voyage, started May 3rd, 1937. There's a picture, actual picture of the hangar in Frankfurt, Germany. Great pictures that are taken. Here it is, you can see it finally got out of the hangar and you can see one of the, uh, one of the four diesel powered engines 
which are mounted outside the Hindenburg. And here's another picture of it. This was to be the first flight in 1937. They had completed the 1936 uh, type of uh, schedule already. I like this picture here. <laughs> I circled, uh, actually circle, put it in red. The three mechanics that surface one of the engines there. <laughs> so you can see the size of the Hindenburg based on the size of the uh, side of the engine. Now it's outside and it's uh, ready for takeoff from Frankfurt, Germany, May 3rd, 1937, and just like another ordinary flight. It starts lifting off. It's great that we have all these original uh, historical photos. Gaining altitude. This is all on May 3rd, 1937. And this is a uh, Famous photo, I guess, was used on a lot of uh, postcards. Uh, husband and his wife, he's got his hat off. He's waving to the Hindenburg as it passes over Germany. Now, across the Atlantic Ocean, that's, that was a uh, kind of a rough trip. Once again, you don't know exactly what the weather's like. Uh, very difficult. Now I circle this picture. Of course, you can see the Atlantic Ocean below. You can see I, on this side here, you can see I uh, circled two of the engines on the exterior and, then, and on the extreme right, that's the um, gondola where the captain is. And of course, there's two other engines on the other side of it. And you can see this weather, whatever, that's it. They have a schedule to meet and they head out across the Atlantic Ocean. So I try to take some pictures uh, to give you an idea of what the passengers looked at. This actual photo is here. Uh, the one on the right is actual, and the one on the left is today. The west coast of Ireland. They came across the west coast of Ireland. Must have been an incredible, uh, incredible trip. This story is amazing. You're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And they've got a crew of 54, and all of a sudden you started getting the outside air wind blowing inside and they, when they did the inspection. And you can see I circled it in the lower right corner. Actually, there was a tear in the outer skin of the Hindenburg. So the men had to go outside while you're crossing the Atlantic. Amazing. To repair that tear, close it up to make it airtight. And you can see this picture here. I, I, the, fella on the, uh, the fella on the left, that's amazing. I don't think I'd be comfortable just sitting there on the other end there looking down at Atlantic Ocean. Not only that, you've got to remember extreme winds and you've got to repair that before you, it starts raining. Dangerous, dangerous job. Then a cat's actual picture down below, I well, came across the Atlantic Ocean, but it was a tough trip. And uh, here we are now. It's When they came across the ocean, it says they came across uh, Halifax, Canada. And that's uh, a site which you would have seen there. And of course, all the passengers, you know, with, with the crew on there, they kept it perfectly level. They had to do that because if you had over 8% uh, uh, <laughs> dip on it, it would, could structurally hurt all the uh, structure on the inside. Um, 
And of course, if you went through a, a cloud with the um, electrical storms, they're always uh, had problems with that. Um, and 24 hours a day, like I said, they had three mechanics on each one of those uh, four diesel engines. And they had to make sure when the diesel started using up the diesel fuel, fuel then the, uh, the weight of the Hindenburg would be decreased and it would start to rise. And they had to make all these adjustments here. But they got across the Atlantic Ocean finally took longer than what they, they said because they said it was uh, a lot of headwinds. And here's a picture coming over Halifax, Canada. But it was, I was fortunate to get this uh, newspaper clipping that was running there. It, it's 12 hours late and I got to remember this. Germans are very, very detailed and they stick to schedules. And what happened was there was so much what they call headwinds that the, um, the speed of the uh, Hindenburg was 84 miles an hour, okay? And because of the headwinds, they could only go 37 miles an hour. And of course, the newspaper clipping said, uh, Dirigible won't land at Lakehurst until 6 p.m. It was supposed to land at 6 a.m. in Lakehurst, New Jersey. And it said it's supposed to start its return trip at once. They're very interested in keeping schedules. And um, I believe there was a coronation of, in England that they had another group of passengers that were going to take it and make it across the Atlantic in time for that. So they were really, really upset because, uh, because of the headwinds and it slowed down this whole Atlantic Ocean crossing. And if you read the article here, uh, the landing of the Hindenburg completed a first transatlantic crossing of the season. That means in 1937. It was delayed today as strong headwinds caused the German Air Queen to reduce her speed to 37 miles an hour. And uh, this was something that uh, really concerned everybody because the weather changes a lot in a 12 hour period. And I just want to uh, show some of the things that I have here on my desk again. <laughs> uh, in the next episode, we're gonna cover uh, how it came across the United States and made its attempting landing at uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey. But there's a couple of things here that are really interesting here. This one here is a movie, if you haven't seen it, it's on uh, DVD, it's, of course, you can pick it up. It's called The Hindenburg, starring George C. Scott and Ann Bancroft. It's very, very well done. If you have a chance, uh, that's something uh, everyone should really uh, take a look at. Definitely worthwhile. And then this other one here, I know I got it at, when it came out on VHS, but uh, it may be on DVD. National Geographic did it on. And of course, uh, they explored uh, exactly what probably could have happened when it crashed. We'll certainly cover that in the next uh, in the next episode. And um, I want to make sure everybody sees these because these are really important documents I have. Once again, this is the, uh, that's the original and the stamps are original and the uh, everything here. So this was on uh, the LZ-129. It may have been on its first trip in 1936 um, I probably won't know that exactly, but that's what they had. And they were sending these all around uh, the world, sort of a, uh, everybody wanted to go on it. I suppose today it would be the equivalent of everybody wants to go on a spaceship uh, in outer space type of thing. And that's, you got to remember there was no passenger airplanes that went, that, at that time, no service that would go across the Atlantic. It was either the Queen Mary or you had to go by the Hindenburg. 
And this is the other one I had. I have to show you this again. It's amazing. And you can see it's uh, has a Hindenburg stamp on it, and uh, that's what they were uh, were sending around. So this is uh, this is episode two. Uh, there's a lot to show. Uh, on the first two episodes, we gave a, a complete background of what's involved in the Hindenburg, and I felt it's important. Uh, not many folks know about this millionaire's uh, type of travel. And of course, what happened was, um, we'll cover it in the next episode, that the whole idea of using um, Hindenburg uh, and do, using that, all the financing, getting it done in the United States so they could go across the United States with this, uh, across the Pacific Ocean, that was their dream. And we'll see in episode three why it was not uh, realized. And it's interesting, I didn't realize it, but they did not ever use uh, the Hindenburg or even the previous flights. They always use hydrogen because it's a lot lighter than the helium. But they did, in fact, wanted to use helium on this new one, the largest one ever in the world. So once again, it's uh, Dave Norton from Discovering New England History. And I hope you enjoyed our trip around New England in the fall in the Hindenburg. And that's exactly what all those executives saw. Terrific marketing tool. So episode three, stay tuned. <laughs> Have a good evening.